Good morning and happy Father's Day. Thank you for joining us here at the South Seaville United Methodist Church. We have services here every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And we would love for you to join us here in South Seaville. We currently uh, are not social distancing any longer or physical distancing. Uh, we're no longer wearing masks unless you need to have a mask on if you've not been vaccinated yet or have some other medical condition. There are spaces here as well. If you'd like to uh, space out, you can. You can sit in the balcony and there's some spaces in the back as well that we've uh, designated for those who'd like to physically distance. A few announcements. Uh, again, today is Father's Day. So again, happy Father's Day. Also, we are recognizing our graduates this Sunday at both of our services uh, and grateful for those uh, accomplishments uh, of learning and education that have happened uh, in our folks. We also have a church picnic coming up on July 11th. Uh, the men are hosting that. Uh, that'll be following our morning service on July 11th. We'll be having one service, one service July 11th at 1030. Uh, weather permitting, that'll be outside. And so following that, we'll be having our uh, church picnic. Uh, family picnic. Also, camp meeting is approaching. Camp meeting will be July 11th through the 25th over at the South Seaville Camp Meeting Grounds. Uh, again, we invite you to join us out there each evening uh, at 7 o'clock for worship together. Uh, we will continue in these days to look at what we believe about God. We've been spending a good amount of time this year. Last year, our theme was faith. This year, our theme is belief and how our beliefs affect how we live, how we behave. And so today we continue to think about what it means to be created in the image of God and some of the wrong conclusions that people come to because they don't believe in God and that we've been created male and female, men and women, in the image of God. I invite you now to bow with me in prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you again for the opportunity to worship you. May our worship, God, be pleasing before you. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, God, for the beautiful week we've had. We thank you, God, for, again, the changing of seasons. And as now as we uh, approach summer, we are grateful, God, for the warmth that we feel in the air. We pray, God, for wisdom and for direction. We thank you, God, for our graduates. We thank you for those who have accomplished so much for our young people, God. We give you praise. We ask you to be with them as they make decisions, as they move on through the summer and, and, and work and get ready for the fall and a new experience and a new school and a new opportunity that you would just continue, God, to bless them. We do pray for uh, our daycare center, Lord, the learning garden. We pray for our staff and for our students, for our families. Through this time, uh, uh, Lord God, we just pray for continued direction and wisdom uh, as we, we, we currently are not open, Lord, and taking care of some things in the building. Be with families, God, through these days as they make adjustments. We thank you, God, for everyone's patience and the patience that you give us in times like this. We ask, Lord, you'd be with those that are struggling. We know that even though many are feeling the sense that uh, uh, the pandemic is, is moving to a close or at least easier than it had been in the past, God, there are still many that are struggling and who are sick. And there's others, God, that have taking the back seat because of the pandemic medically, God, in conditions and situations. And we pray for them, God. We pray you'd give them the direction they need and the motivation they need to get the help that's needed. We thank you, God, again, that you are the great physician. And we also thank you that you've given us a mind to think and reason and to get help. You've given people intelligence and ingenuity and creativity and the ability to come up with vaccines and and procedures, God, that help us. Help us physically, God. Help us physically, God, so that we can be a better witness for you. Yes, we'd like to live longer in these bodies, God, yet we know that these bodies will deteriorate and fail. But God, while we have breath in these bodies, while we're on this side of glory, we know you have a mission for us. You have a purpose for us. You want us to be welcoming. You want us to be loving. You want us, God, to be helping people come to a fuller relationship with your son, Jesus. And so, God, our worship, our growing, our sharing, our serving, all these things, God, that we do in response to your great love for us, may they be pleasing before you. Help us continue to grow. Help us to continue to mature. We continue to lift up our leaders, leaders in our churches, our bishop. 
Continue to lift up, God, those leaders in our community, those leaders in our state, those leaders in our country. Be with our president. Be with all those making decisions, God, that affect others. Be with the world leaders. God, we're grateful that we can come to you and communicate and pray. You are a relational God. And that when we pray, you hear us. You know our hearts. Yet, God, you want us to articulate those things, to cast our cares upon you. So we do that today, God. Whatever else is burdening us, whatever else is bothering us, we cast our cares upon you, knowing that you care. Thank you, God, again, for always being there, for never leaving us, never forsaking us. Thank you, God, again, for creating us in your image. Now, God, unite us as we pray together the prayer that you taught your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. Good morning. And happy Father's Day, everyone. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Mike. Today's scripture comes from the book of Genesis. Chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, and then chapter 2, verses 7 through 24. Chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make people in our image to be like ourselves. They will be masters over all life, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the livestock, wild animals, and all small animals. So God created people in his own image. God patterned them after himself. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and told them, Multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Be masters over the fish and birds and all the animals. And God said, Look, I have given you the seed-bearing plants throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given all the grasses and other green plants to the animals and birds for their food. And so it was. Then God looked over all he had made. And he saw that it was excellent in every way. This happened on the sixth day. Chapter 2, verses 7 through 24. And the Lord God formed a man's body from the dust of the ground and breathed into the breath of life. And the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had created. And the Lord God planted all sorts of trees in the garden beautiful trees that produce delicious fruit. At the center of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden, water in the garden, and then dividing into four branches. One of these branches is Pishon, which flows around the entire land of Hevela, which gold is found. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure. Aromic resin and ox stone were also found there. The second branch is the Gion, which flows around the entire land of Cush. The third branch is the Tigris, which flows to the east of Asher. The fourth branch is the Euphrates. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and care for it. But the Lord God gave him this warning. You may freely eat any fruit in the garden, except fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a companion who will help him. So the Lord God formed from the soil every kind of animal and bird. He brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And Adam chose a name for each one. He gave them names to all the livestock, birds, and the wild animals. But still there was no companion suitable for him. So the Lord God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. He took one of Adam's ribs and closed up and placed from which he had taken it. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to Adam. At last, Adam exclaimed, she is part of my own flesh and bone. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Would you bow with me in prayer? 
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We are continuing our understanding about what we believe and what we think about God. Part of the very nature of God is to make himself and his purposes known. His communication to us illustrates his love for us. That culminated in the very presence of God's Son, Jesus, born in the flesh. That baby born in a manger, visited by shepherds and by magi. That God is with us, Emmanuel. Connected with our beliefs is our practice. Beliefs mean nothing unless they lead to some changed behavior. Our text, our source for the study of God is the Bible. Our only inerrant source of truth. The Bible is accurate and totally free of error. You see, only God can define who God is, and he's done that through this book, the Bible. Within these pages, God reveals himself in a personal way as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father reveals himself through the Son who glorifies the Father on earth by accomplishing the work God had given him to do. The Holy Spirit, in relationship to the Father and Son, helps us understand who they are and what they have said. How God interrelates with himself is an illustration and a model of how we need to and we can relate to God and one another. We looked at the divine attributes of God the Father, those unique to God and God alone, those that God possesses, and those that God enables us to possess. We talked about creation, that everything seen, everything unseen, all matter has its existence only because of God's will. God spoke and it was done. God spoke the world into existence. Every stage of the process of creation was initiated by God. Everything, everything exists because of the work of God. And in Genesis 131, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. We said that the purpose of creation is to praise the creator. You and I were made to worship God. And last week we spent some time talking about man and woman. The creation of man and woman is the pinnacle, the the apex of creation. It's the last thing and the final thing that God created. God thought and he spoke to himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he said this, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 2, 7 says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. What makes human beings distinct from all the rest of creation is that God breathed into them the breath of life. We've been created in the image of God, and God blessed them, the scripture says, and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We talked about the image of God that is inside all of us, that makes human beings, every human being, different and unique from everything else that has been created. You and I, every person is special. Again, if you missed last week, be sure to go online to Facebook or YouTube and watch or listen to any or all of these messages that I've been referring to this morning. Today, I want us to look at some of the common misconceptions or Conclusions, misunderstandings in our culture that our culture has come to from not understanding the truth that you have been created in the image of God. Now, I know some of what I'm going to say today, some may disagree with. By the way, no one should believe everything someone else says. Go look it up for yourself. Remember, we've been created in the image of God. God has given us a mind to think. We have intelligence. You can reason. 
But realize, whatever conclusion you come to has consequences. What we believe affects how we live. So the first one I'd like us to mention is this idea of naturalistic evolution, often associated with, with Darwinism. The idea that human beings emerge out of successive generations of biological organisms through a process of natural selection and survival of the fittest. This idea, which again is just a theory, an unproven theory, demoralizes and debases the image of God in human beings. It minimizes or ignores it. Now, close to this idea is theistic evolution that says at some point, God stepped into the evolutionary process and created human beings. Friends, Adam was not some mythological character. If you fall into that trap that Adam was not a real person, you have a serious problem with the reality of Jesus. Any view that regards Adam as less than an historical person will eventually have problems with Jesus being real. Jesus is called the second Adam. And as we said last week, the Bible tells us that the first man, Adam, was created by God in his image and likeness, directly from the dust of the ground. God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So Adam was not a product of some form of theistic evolution. God did not make him in the image or likeness of, of an ape or a, a lower form of life by any lengthy or, or mutual mutation process. Rather, God created the first Adam as an immediate act by his word, by commanding or willing it to happen at some point on the sixth day of creation. While the first Adam was made in the image of God, the second Adam, Jesus the Christ, is the image of the invisible God. If Adam never existed, you will have a problem with the existence of Jesus. See, Jesus came to remedy what happened from the first Adam and allow humanity to be redeemed and healed from their sin. If there was no Adam, there was no original sin. If there was no original sin, there's no need for Jesus. That's a problem. Another misconception that follows from losing the idea that we've been created in the image of God is sexual perversion. Now, if you go back and study the Canaanite culture and the worship of Baal, it was so repugnant and disgusting to God that God commanded their extinction. Now, a question often is asked, why? And theologians have wrestled with this for years. Why? If, if God is merciful, if God is forgiving, if God is full of grace, and, and, and it's available to everyone. Why would God command the Israelites to exterminate an entire people? It, it doesn't make sense. I mean, we thought, wasn't God a, isn't God a loving God? One of the major parts of Canaanite worship, their lifestyle, was the sacrificing of children and sexual perversion, including orgies, prostitution, bestiality, and homosexuality. Friends, our sexuality is a gift from God. Our sexuality, it's a gift from God. And let me remind us that the United Methodist Church still believes marriage is a sacred covenant between a man and a woman reflecting Christ's covenant with the church. The scripture clearly teaches that God laid down a pattern for natural sexual relations that men and women should be united in marriage. The two would become one flesh. That pattern, and only that pattern, for sexual relations is God's norm. Anything other than that pattern, sexual relations between a person with the same sex or with an animal, in the scripture it's called an abomination to God. I invite you to go home. Don't take my word for it. Go home. Read Leviticus 18 and 20, Romans 1, 24 to 27. See, what you find is that the root of, of, of the problem is, is selfishness. That's the root of all sin. Becoming self-indulgent, indulgent, becoming narcissistic, desiring self-gratification, and insulting the image of God in another person. 
and I know this is intense, this is heavy stuff, that we can satisfy our own fleshly desires and think no one will get hurt, that the choices we make only affect us, but friends, it affects the people around us. Not every choice we make is a good choice or a right choice. Again, we are relational beings. We do need one another. We communicate with each other. We, we make commitments to and with one another. But you know where sexual perversion stems from? This idea that you and I have a right to whatever we want to, and we have a right to do whatever makes us happy. That's a current characteristic of our culture. So for so many, the, the marriage covenant doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's amazing to me how many people are having sex these days outside of a marriage covenant and think nothing of it. It's become acceptable. It's become the norm. Friends, our sexuality is a gift from God. Listen, if you believe you've been created in the image of God, then every person you see was created in the image of God. If you abuse them for personal satisfaction and self-gratification, you are abusing the gift within you and them. If you abuse someone for personal satisfaction and for self-gratification, you are abusing the gift within you and them. I'm not sure I can make that any clearer. The last misconception about being created in the image of God results in the abuse of the human body. The ultimate expression that I'm an individual and I'm different from everybody else is the mistreatment of our bodies. People abuse their bodies with drugs, but the problem is, is not drugs. It is failing to understand that these bodies were created in the image of God. Listen, any harmful substance or practice that debilitates our health, health that damages the image we have been created in. See, the scripture tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. What does that mean? It means that we need to respect our bodies. Let me share with you some final conclusions we should have in understanding that you and I have been created in the image of God. The first one is this, is that every person, every person, is valuable and has sacred worth. Every person is valuable and has sacred worth. Every fallen man and woman bears the image of God. Every person you see is one for whom Jesus died. That makes you. That makes them. That makes everyone valuable. Valuable. Second, we are our brothers and sisters keeper. God made us social beings. God knew that it was not good for us to be alone. We need each other. We need relationships. Marriage was God's idea. And from that first union, everyone born into the world has two persons already bonded to them. We call them parents. And very likely, because of the family unit, there are many others that are bonded to them. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. You can even think about it this way. We're all descendants. We're all descendants of Adam. Therefore, we're all related to each other. If you were to go back far enough in your own genealogy, you are related to the person sitting next to you the person in front of you, the person behind you, the person sitting at the traffic light, the person in the supermarket line, your doctor, your dentist, your mechanic, your teacher, your tax advisor. We are all related to each other. And because of that conclusion, everyone deserves equal respect. When we depreciate the dignity of any member of humanity, we diminish our own. God loves everyone. And we are most like God, the image in which we have been created, when we behave like, when we love like God loves. We are our brother and sister's keeper. 
And the third conclusion I think we should come to, we can come to, is that we should cherish our sexuality. We should cherish it. We possess within us the ability to create another person, other people. When a man and woman come together, you have the ability to bring another person into existence. You have the opportunity to nurture that person in the image of God. That is serious power and responsibility, to nurture them in the image of God. But there's even more than just the, the creation of making more human beings. We understand relationship inside the family unit. Remember we talked about in, in, we talked about the Trinity, the triangle, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the husband, wife, and God, the mother, child, mother, father, and God, that each one of us cares more about the other than ourselves. That is a Trinity self-giving relationship. You have the opportunity to care more about another created being than yourself. You and I and every other human being ever created has been created in the image of of God. Think about that. I often share this when I meet with couples to have their child baptized. That one of our primary responsibility as a member of a human family is to nurture the image of God in those closest to us. As a mom or a dad, your role is to help your child see the image of God in them and help them develop that image of God in them. I often wonder how we might behave differently if we thought more about that. That one of the roles of, of a parent, a mother, a father, is to help our children understand and know the truth that they've been created in the image of God. That they might see God's image in themselves and others. I wonder how we might act differently if we really believed that. Remember, believing is easy. Allowing those beliefs to really change our life that's why we gather. That's why we're here. If, if we did not think this way, then when we think the other way, the way of the world, opposite from the way God's word says. So we gather here for fellowship. We gather for instruction, for support, for direction, for clear, correct understanding through the word of God, who God is and who we are. Friends, may we continue to allow God to mold us into his image, clear and clear, as we desire and we help mold others and help others see that they too have been created in the image of God. Amen? Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, forgive us for wrong thinking, wrong behavior. Forgive us for perverting the gift you have given us. Forgive us for our selfishness. Lord God, help us see that we are valuable. Help us understand our responsibility to each other, that we are our brother and sister's keeper. Help us know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we have the awesome power to create life, to educate that life, to communicate you, communicate your love to those lives around us. Lord God, help us to not grow close to the world around us, to not be molded into its image, into its likeness. But God, help us grow closer and closer. Help us be drawn closer and closer to you each day. Help us live a life of love. Help us live a life of sacrifice. Help us live a life of hope. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Friends, God bless you as you go forth this day. Go forth reflecting God's image in you to others. Go forth humbling others, particularly those closest to you in your own family, that, that they may know that they too have been created in the image of God, that they have sacred worth, that Jesus loves them and he died for their sins. Go forth loving God and loving others, serving God and serving others. Go forth in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week.